Well, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, please, to the book of Mark, the 12th chapter of the book of Mark. I want to read uh, verses, uh, about three or four verses, starting with verse 41. I uh, didn't realize that you had been through something of a, a financial surge. I, or I, uh, Pastor mentioned your special offering that you had on last Sunday, so this may seem odd timing. I, I felt moved to preach on this this morning. I want to preach on uh, finding God's financial favor. And at the end of the message, what I'm, what I'm leading to is a closing prayer so that you will know that. I, and, and if you don't want that prayer, don't ask for it. I, I'm, I'm not going to pray down on you. I want to pray as a servant, as your servant, as if I could wash your feet. I, I have uh, come to a place in my life where I'm finding tremendous liberty in praying for people about moving in under God's financial favor. Um, but the fact that I have liberty in that prayer, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying somebody's going to give you a million dollars on the way home from church. That is, that's not the point at all. What I have found is this. In any area where you find, where one finds liberty in praying, if it's for physical healing or for whatever it is, wherever one finds great liberty in praying, I find also that there is usually great effectiveness. And uh, at this stage in my life, I'm finding wonderful liberty praying for people about financial favor. So I'd like to speak on that. And then the point is the prayer at the end. But you can opt out. I'm not, if you would say, I'm not interested in that. I don't want that prayer and I'm offended by it or whatever. I always am amazed with people that are offended by prayers about financial favor. <laughs> But if you are, then great. People say this to me. They say, I don't want the church to become a bless me club. Okay, I know where they're headed with that. I, I think I understand what they mean with that. I don't want to use God for just for naked financial gain. I understand what they mean by that. But what's the opposite of that? I don't want the church to be a curse me club. Right? I mean, bless me is a lot better than curse me. Right? Right? So what's, what's the opposite of, of a bless me club? I, I don't really know what that is. But I, I believe that the scripture is clear. God says, I want to bless you. In blessing, I will bless thee. God wants to bless us. What he wants is for us to remove any barrier that there is to the blessing. And that may be in all kinds of ways. The blessing of, of health, the 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 blessing of family, the blessing of restoration of relationships. But one area of life is finances. We, we have to be there. That's, you, you have to pay the water bill. So it seems to me that it's a logical thing for the church to deal with what does the Bible teach about financial blessing. So I, I would like to share that with you this morning. Okay, enough of that. Mark chapter 12, and begin reading at verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, that is, at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And then came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, two little tiny coins, which make a farthing. And Jesus called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this widow hath cast in more than all they which cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments... I pray that your Holy Spirit will overwhelm, sweep aside every barrier to divine communication. In me, anything that I might say that would be unnecessarily hindering to people to hear from you, I pray, God, that you will overwhelm that. Anything, any resistance in any listener, brush it aside with the fingertips of the Holy Spirit and rush in over the threshold of our souls 
enter in by your might into the inner person of every listener that when we leave here, we will say one to another, surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is a tiny little pulpit. <laughs> you must use tiny little notes. I'm so impressed. <laughs> The, uh, one of the most common um, ways that Jesus summoned people was a simple two-word phrase, follow me. He went to the, the desk of Matthew, the tax collector, and summoned him out of his career, everything that he knew, all that he did, his family, his life, everything. He said, follow me. And the man just got up and walked and followed Jesus. He still says that to us. Follow me. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, I want to follow Jesus in every way. I want to follow Jesus in prayer. I want to follow Jesus in service. I want to follow Jesus in every way. If we're going to follow him in every way, I want to know what following him means in the financial area of my life. Well, the indication and indication that we have of what that looks like is in the passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 12. I, I want to be like a person that Jesus admired and respected. We don't know anything about this lady, about her name. We know she was elderly. We know that she was a widow. We know that she was poor. And we know that she was generous. And 2,000 years after her death, her story one moment she appeared in the life of Jesus is still celebrated and read because Jesus admired her. He called his disciples to him. Look at her. Look what she just did. He said, that's what I'm trying to teach you. If you're going to follow me with your whole life, if you're not going to carve off your financial life, but if you're going to follow me with the whole life, that's what I want it to look like. We talk about John 3.16. It is probably the most common, most frequently quoted passage of Scripture with regard to, to giving. I hear it quoted in churches all over the world at the time of the offering. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, then we jump from that for God so loved the world that he gave. So if we're going to be like God, we're going to give. But we tend to confine it to John 3, 16, that God is a giving God because he gave us his son. I, I've, I cannot give you an exhaustive list, but I want to give you just 20, quickly, I'm just going to go through them like this, 20 places in scripture where God gives. Think of all the things that God gives us. If he never gave us anything except his son for our salvation, it were plenty. That were enough, right? But what else does he give? Ezra 9.9, 9, he gives revival. Psalm 29.11, he gives strength. Psalm 37.4, he gives us the desires of our heart. Psalm 84.11, he gives grace and he gives glory. Matthew 6, 11, we just prayed it. He gives us our daily bread. John 10, 28, he gives us life and life more abundant. John 14, 27, he gives peace, which passes all understanding. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, he gives increase. John 1, James 1, 5, he gives wisdom. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, wow, on this one, he gives the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 2 and 8, he gives us the faith. E Ecclesiastes 5 and 19, listen to all the things in one verse. He gives riches, wealth, the power to eat of the fruit of our labor. He gives us the power to rejoice in our labor. He gives us the grace to enjoy our jobs. That's an amazing one. Romans 5, 15, he gives salvation. 1 Corinthians 12, he gives all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. James 1.17 says he gives every good and perfect gift. James 4.6, he 
He gives grace to the humble. John 1, 12, he gives the power to become the children of God. Romans 6, 23, he gives eternal life. In other words, you cannot reduce the giving power of God to one simple idea. Yes, he gives because he gave us his son. God gives and gives and gives and gives. I, I, I love the modern praise courses. I, I love contemporary Christian music. It's wonderful. But just every now and again, am I the only one? I wish we'd sing something that wasn't written in the last eight minutes. <laughs> but but here's, an, here's an old, 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 old hymn. Probably nobody in the room is going to remember it but me. It was written by Annie Johnson Flint. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. What a wonderful little poem. He gives and gives and gives. If you want to understand who God is, it is impossible to comprehend who God is apart from giving. How God is a giving God. So therefore, what does that mean to us? So here it is. When he says, follow me, and he praises this widow who throws in the last money she has at that moment, then God is telling us a generous life is what he's talking about. So let's deal with one thing first off, tithing. Let's just, let me deal with this straight away because this is where a lot of people stumble. I have not cleared this with the pastor. <laughs> Probably should have done that. Anything that I teach that's wrong, he can straighten it out next week. Um, it's one of my goals in ministry is to leave the pastor something to clean up. Um, but here's what, here's what I've come to believe about tithing, and it is this. I, I, I hear people say all the time, tithing is a law. That's the law. That's the Old Testament. That's an Old Testament law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. When people say that to me, I don't even argue with them. I say, you're 100% right. We're no longer under the law, and tithing is Old Testament. That's the law. We're under grace. Then I say, but however, I have a question for you. Does grace do less than the law or more than the law? The law says 10%, and you say you're under grace. Do you do less than 10% because you're under grace or more than 10% because you're under grace? And I've had many people say, you know what? I, I actually am under the law. Um, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it until you put it that way, Dr. Rutten. So what is tithing? Tithing is percentage giving. That's what it means. Percentage giving. 10%. Then there are all kinds of questions. People ask all these questions. Is that 10% of the gross? Is it 10% before taxes? Is it 10% after taxes? All of those are just, they're legal questions that deal with where your faith is. So here's what I would say. The tithe is 10%. But if your faith is not there, then start where your faith is. If you're, if you're at 3%, if you say, okay, I'm just, I just don't have 10% faith right now. I don't think God is angry. He says, I'm going to lead you into greater and greater levels of generosity so that I can give you greater and greater levels of financial favor. But if 10%, if your faith is not at 10%, start where you are. 3%, 5%, 7%. The thing is, know where you are. Know where you are. Take, take your checkbook, take your calculator and figure it out. What percentage do you give? There are a lot of people who think they give a lot more than they do. So figure it out. Know what it is and give that percent. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that no matter what percentage you give, you will not miss it and you'll be able to go up in the year. You'll find the faithfulness of God at that percent. If 3% is what you can give, give that. Then you'll go to 5%, then 7%, then 10%. That's, the, that's tithing. But don't, don't make it, don't make it that this begrudging, obligatory thing. Okay, God, here's your tithe. 
I don't know who, count, who counts the offering in this church. I don't know who does that. You ever get these checks? $243.17. Stop with that. I know, I know exactly what that is. And somebody sit down with their paycheck and a calculator and they multiply times 0.1. Okay, there are $243.17. There's your tithe and not one penny more. Come on, round it up. That's, that's the tithe. I, I believe in tithing and I believe that God calls us to it. Many, many years ago, I was in my very first church. I was pastoring right at the uh, end of the Civil War. And <laughs> that's rude to laugh at me. Um, and uh, I, I really came in under the tutelage of an older Methodist, I was in Methodist church, an older Methodist evangelist that I just admired tremendously who's in heaven now, Dr. Claude Smithmeyer. And I went with him occasionally to revivals where he would preach to learn what he was doing. We came to one church and we just came in and I was walking with him right down the aisle like this right here. And a man just stepped out of the aisle and said, Dr. Smithmeyer, I know you don't recognize me, but you were my pastor years ago. And I was really, really down on my down on my luck and really suffering financially. And, and you, you convinced me to start tithing and I did. And I want you to know, I just want to tell you something. This year, I had a net, net income of $2 million. And Dr. Smithmeyer said, oh, I'm so happy to hear that. He said, are you still tithing? And the man said, Dr. Smithmeyer, you, you don't comprehend what I just said to you. I, my net income after taxes was $2 million, $2 million. He said, I can't afford to tithe on that. <laughs> Dr. Smithmeyer, without a moment hesitation, he said, well, will you let me pray for you again? The guy said, I sure will. Dr. Smithmeyer put his arm around his shoulder and he said, oh God, I pray that you will cut this man's income back to the place where he can afford to tithe. <laughs> If you want that prayer, raise your hand. No, I'm the... So I, I believe in tithing, I, but I want to say this to you. That's not the, that's not the piece de resistance. That's not, that's not the pinnacle of, of what God calls us to. What God calls us to is the spirit of generosity, not just financially in everything, in everything in life. I remember, I, I preached a funeral some years ago. A lady in my church died and I went to the viewing at the funeral home and over the casket was, if you ever see these blanket of roses that are like at the, at the um, Kentucky Derby? I mean, it was a blanket of roses over this casket went down to the ground. And her husband who was standing at the end of the casket he was there and I went up, I said, Howard, look at this. This is gorgeous. Who gave this? He said, well, I did. I, I, I did that. He said, my wife always used to say to me, give me some, buy me some roses, buy me some roses. He said, well, I just wasn't into that kind of thing. I'm just not, I'm not that kind of a guy. Well, I'm, but I'm making it up to her now. <laughs> well, it's like too late. <laughs> buy her the roses now. I'm not just talking about in church. I'm talking about generosity of life. Generous with your praise. Generous with your compliments. Generous with your affirmation. Guys, listen to me. When your wife comes in from the shopping mall with that new dress on, she says, look what I bought at the shopping mall. She's modeling it for you. She doesn't want you to peer over the top of the sports page. How much did that cost? Set me back and I'll confiscate your credit card. <laughs> you ruined it for her. This is what she wants. She wants you to throw the newspaper aside and jump to your feet and say, whoa. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> Baby, look at you. You wear that on Wednesday night and we're going to be late to prayer meeting. <laughs> now that's what she wants to hear. That's generosity. That's going beyond. <laughs> Ladies, let me help you. <laughs> Your husband is like God in one way. 
Saw one woman right back there say, this is why I came right here. This is what I... No, the Bible says God has numbered every hair on your husband's head. So has your husband. And he does not need you to remind him that the number is diminishing annually. He wants the same thing you want. When I... When I leave my house to go off on one of these trips, my beautiful wife of 52 years, 52 years, it's been 52 years of unbroken delight for me. Allison's had two or three minutes of happiness in it too. And it's, (laughs) when I leave the house, she puts her hands on my face and she says, oh, Mark, you're the sexiest man that ever lived. Look, look up here, look. I live in the real world, (laughs) but I like that level of generosity, the spirit of generosity that goes above. If the tithe is the beginning, we're talking about the spirit of generosity. Just, just once, just once in my life. You remember the story in Exodus where the elders, Moses takes up this offering to build the tabernacle and the elders come to Moses and say, Moses, you got to make them stop. Make them stop. They're giving too much. They're giving too much. I don't need that every Sunday, but just once (laughs) where the people count the offering, come to the pastor and say, pastor, you got to make them quit. The spirit of generosity. There was a, a, a lady in my first church, um, little tiny Methodist church in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. And she gave us a a little organ, not a pipe organ, but a little, a little roll tie. I think it was a Wurlitzer. And she came and gave us the organ. Well, you just can't have a Methodist church without an organ. So we were very happy to get it, but she kept the key at her house. It was one of these things you pull down and lock it with the key. Every time we needed the organ, every time we had a funeral or a wedding or Sunday morning service, we had to get, we couldn't go to the house and get her key. We had to go to the house and get her and bring her to unlock it. When it was finished, we had to go get her again to come back with the key and lock it back. I was 22, a 22 year old boy ought not to be given a driver's license, let alone a church. And finally, I just had had it to hear. And I took some boys from the Methodist Youth Fellowship. We loaded the organ in the back of a pickup truck, drove to her house and put it on her front porch. She came out. We were alone. She said, what are you doing? I said, I brought you your organ. Oh, no, she said. No, no, I, that's not mine. I gave it to the church. I said, no, ma'am, you did not give it to the church. You loaned it. He who owneth the key owneth the organ. It's all yours. Um, she never came to the church again. Uh, <laughs> I believe she took that organ and went and blessed the Presbyterians down the road. No, but see, that's, that's not giving. That's not giving. That's, that's not generosity. She was buying something with that. And do you know what she was buying? Control. That, was, that had nothing to do with generosity. Let me tell you about another man, though. I was in my office at Global Servants at our missions uh, organization. A guy walked in with the keys and the the title, everything to a brand brand new top of the line BMW. Still had this sticker on the window. He came in later on my desk. He said, I bought this this afternoon, paid cash for it. And he said, when I drove it off the showroom floor, God spoke to me as I've never heard in my life. Take this and give it to global servants. And so he said, here it is, I'm leaving. I said, wait a minute, I gotta ask you some questions. I need to know what strings are attached here. You can, you can get burned by a gift like the organ where the lady keeps the keys. I, I wasn't sure what the story was here. I said, are there strings attached? Do I, do I have to drive it? Do I have to, what, what's the, what do you want here? He said, Dr. Ellen, I don't care if you push it over a cliff. He said, I've done what I was told. It's all yours. I said, well, where do you live? Let me drive you home. He said, no, no. God said, I'm going to walk home. He said, said, I've learned a lesson. I didn't pray about buying this. 
He said, I never consulted God over whether or not to buy this. The minute I bought it, God said, now give it away. So he said, I've learned my lesson. I'll just walk home. I have no idea how far away he lived. I don't know how he got home. So I called the board at Global Servants and I said, what? Well, this is what's happened. This guy's given this. I said, it's valuable automobile. And they said, well, let's all pray before the next board. We got a month to the next board meeting. Let's pray and, and see what God wants us to do about it. And they said, you just drive the car until we have the board meeting. Okay, I want to tell you something. That car was soundproof. Um, I could not hear God. In, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not saying it's bad. I, I'm just saying I, I, I could not hear God in that car. <laughs> so we had our board meeting. I said, boys, you, you're going to have to hear from the Lord on this. I can't. That car's soundproof. I, and, you know, they, they made the decision. They sold the BMW. And we were young, good lands. It was 25 years ago. And they bought Allison and me a brand new Dodge Dynasty, our first new car we'd ever had in our lives. They bought a little Dodge Dynasty that we drove. They took the balance of the money and built five churches in South India. Wow. Isn't that great? The spirit of generosity, the spirit of release that goes beyond, that goes beyond simply doing what we're told. What comes of that? I'm going to tell you something that I think most people, most is too strong a word, many people in the church who are diligent in giving and diligent in tithing miss. And that's the joy of generosity. The joy of it. I, I wish that Americans could see an offering in Africa. I wish you could just see it. They don't pass plates like this in African churches. Somebody stands up here at the front, two or three, with big tubs like this, and the people come forward and give their offering, but they don't walk. They dance. They dance up and then dance back. And, and it's, it's joyful. I was at a church in Benin City, Nigeria one time, and we're sitting up on the platform, and after the big offering, an elderly lady came up, and she had two eggs in her hand, and she was weeping, just weeping, and she came up and laid those eggs on the altar and danced back to her seat. And I said to the pastor, I said, what's wrong with that lady? She looks like she's in terrible distress. Oh, he said, no, no, no. He said, I know that lady. Those are tears of joy. He said, it's the first time she's had anything extra beyond her tithe all year. And she has brought those eggs as an offering and she's weeping with joy. I, I wish that American Christians could get the joy of it. I'll tell you why one of the reasons we can't. It is because, and I'm just going to say that because we don't tithe, we can't take any joy in offerings because if you don't tithe, you can't really give an offering because what you think is an offering is actually making up the tithe that you should have already given. So if you tithe, you're now at the place where you can make offerings, a thank offering, just a, a spun, not just a special offering the church takes up, but just a, a thank offering. You have a, a, new, a new baby or, or, or better than that, a new grandchild. <laughs> Grandchildren are God's reward for not choking your own to death. That's <laughs> when they deserved it. Um, but you, you have that new grandchild and that Sunday morning, you just, you just want to thank God. You just want to bring that extra offering and just write on it, write on the, on the check. Thank offering. Sometimes a, a special purpose offering like you had evidently last Sunday. I'm probably preaching on this a week too late, but that, that special offering that you had last Sunday or a missions offering or whatever, it is, those are offerings that should give you joy. They, they should be a delight to you to give to those things. And then finally, there is God's part. There's, there is God's part. What comes of it? I have... I have found the adventure of giving and receiving. It's not about, don't turn this into a cash on the barrel head, arm's length business arrangement. That steals all the joy of it. 
okay, God, here's your hundred dollars. I expect a hundred thousand by nightfall or you're not God and the Bible's a lie. I, I, I hate that stuff and I think God hates it. But what I'm talking about is the adventure, the joy of it. When uh, many years ago, when we first started Global Servants, I resigned the last Methodist church I ever pastored and we started our missions agency, Global Servants. We were, we were living on a shoestring. We rented out a small property with an old uh, barn that somebody had started converting into a, a building. We rented it and I renovated the upstairs, the old hayloft of that barn, and I moved my two-year-old and my pregnant wife into the renovated uh, hayloft of that barn, and we started to turn the ground into a retreat center. And we were starting to have retreats, prayer retreats, and healing retreats, and some things like that. The early days of the charismatic renewal movement, we leased this from an elderly lady. We had built, then my dad came, we built a bunkhouse there and we bought an old used tractor and I was mowing. It was, it was just a fun adventure sometime. However, that elderly lady's lawyer showed up in my office one day and he said, she's decided to sell the property. Well, I don't know about Florida, but in Georgia, if you sell a leased property, you also have to deal, you have to honor the lease. I said, no problem. I'm sure the new owner will honor the lease. He said, no, the new owner will not buy it unless you get out. So he said, you have to leave. I said, sir, I have a lease. And he said, now, reverend, listen to Dr. Mark. Whenever a businessman starts with the word reverend, you know he's just about to take you down. He said, listen to me, reverend. He said, are you going to go to law with an elderly widow? He said, you want that in the newspaper? I said, well, is there anything I can do? He said, yes. The price is $120,000 cash in 30 days. You got 30 days. Come up. I said, 120,000, make it 120 million. I said, I don't have 120. He said, well, that's it. Get out in 30 days or pay $120,000 cash or lose the whole thing. All that we had built, all of our, all of our renovations, everything. I was leaving the next day for two weeks in Ghana. I called my only employee, a part-time secretary, and I said, do we have, we have any money in the bank account? She said, I, I don't know if we do or not. I said, my tickets are paid. And I said, I won't need money in Ghana. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a check to a, a Methodist ministry that I believed in a lot. And I said, I want you to write them a check for $120. She said, oh, oh Brother Rutland, I... I don't believe we have $120. I said, well, go check. She came back. She said, okay, I can write the check, but I'll never forget this. She said, you're going to have $17 in Global Servants Bank account. Do you sure you want to go to Africa and leave Global Servants with $17 in the bank account? I said, well, no, I'm sure I don't want to do that, but that is what we're going to do. But I said, write the check quickly. I'm weak. We wrote that check. We sent it to a very successful ministry. And I went to Africa. Two weeks later, I landed at the airport, went to my house, and I got a phone call from a guy. He said, Brother Rutland, I'm on the board of a foundation. And a man died, set it up in his will, that the interest off of what he set up would be given every year to missions. But he's been gone for years. The board are all getting older. We're tired of it, and we've decided to give away the principal and disband the foundation. And we're gonna, we're gonna give it to you, to Global Servants. I said, you don't, you don't mind if I ask how much that is. He said, it's a New England telephone and telegraph bond for $120,000. This guy's in Jacksonville, I'm in Atlanta. He said, I'll put it in the mail to you. I said, no, uh, no. I'll be there in about five and a half hours. <laughs> I want it in my hot little hand. That, that, that's been the spirit of adventure my whole life for years. It's just to give with joy and watch it flow back the other way. I went to hear a friend of mine speak. And at the end of it, he said, he said, if you will give a generous check tonight, he said, I'd like to pray for you. And he spoke about a ministry that he supported and gave a lot to. And it just came to me to write a check for $1,000. That probably doesn't challenge you very much, but just 
$1,000 without even asking my wife's permission. And <laughs> so I thought, you know, I'm just going to do that. I wrote the check for $1,000 and maybe this doesn't connect. Maybe it does. I don't, I'm just telling you the story. I was the president at Southeastern University and the driveway is a, a half drive like this, a half circle. And the president's office sits right here. So I can see every person that pulls into the guest place. And I was sitting there about two weeks later and a beat up old flowered van, looked like it had escaped from 1974, pulled up into the guest place and two unusual people got out. She had on a calf length moo moo and he had a waist long uh, ponytail and they got it, came in. I said, wow. And in a few minutes, my secretary came and said, Dr. Rutland, there's two people here that want to speak with you. I said, is it the folks that got out of that flowered van? And she said, yes, it is. I said, well, bring them in. And they came in and said, the man never said one word. The lady said, my, my mother's died and left us some money. And she said, we, we drive past this school all the time. And she said, the children seem so happy. <laughs> These are university students. She thought she was looking at an elementary school playground. She said, since you came here, the children seem so happy. And she said, we, we're just going to give it to, to this school. I said, well, that's, that's so nice of you. Uh, she said, well, we, our trailer is paid for. She said, the van is paid for. We, we thought, what would we use it? We can't think what we'd use it for. We're just going to give it to the school. I said, are you alumni? Oh, no. They said, we never went to college. We don't know anything. But we just want to bless the children. I said, well, that, that'll be great. How do you want to give it? She said, I'm going to write checks. She said, now, President Rutland, she said, is it all right with you if I write this on two different banks? God will speak to you if you'll listen. I said, ma'am, take all the banks you need. She wrote a check for $485,000 on one bank and $515,000 on the other bank. It's the first million dollar contribution that Southeastern University ever received. Now you can, you can say it, no connection, but the moment, the moment that million dollar check was in my hand, the first thing I thought of was that thousand dollar contribution. I, I, it went straight in my spirit. I called a friend of mine that I knew would, you receive a million dollar contribution, Pastor, I think you'll be amazed how few of your colleagues will rejoice with you. And I, uh, I called a friend of mine that I knew would rejoice. I told him about it. Listen to what he said. Isn't this great? Listen to this. He said, that's better than you think. I said, how could it be better than I think? He said, because now you're in the first time in your life, you're in a place where you can receive your second million dollar contribution. You've never been there before. You had to get the first one. Isn't that faith? I love that. I said, I'm, I'm on this. <laughs> A little while later, uh, an elderly man from my church at Calvary, I had pastored a mega church in Orlando and he came over to the university. I hadn't seen him in years. He was in his 90s. I was so happy to see him. We, I drove him around in the campus in the golf cart. The kids at the university were so good to him. They waved to him. They got to know him. We went to chapel. He sat right over here, and I had him stand, and they, they applauded for him and everything, and he started coming back over to the campus, and the kids just recognized him, and they were wonderful. They'd love on him. One day, I went in the restaurant at the university in the dining hall, and he was sitting at a table uh, with three college girls. And I said, well, hey man, how you doing? He said, actually, this is one of the better days of my life. And <laughs> he just became kind of the, you know, grandpa for the campus or whatever. He used to, when I was at Calvary Church, he used to bring me orange, oranges in a brown paper sack. He said, these are some oranges. You know, everybody in central Florida has got an orange tree in the backyard. But I didn't think he had two pennies to rub together. He went on a mission trip with his church and he fell in Narita Airport in Tokyo and broke his hip and he never recovered. I went to the viewing at the funeral home and a man in a nice looking man in a suit and tie walked up to me. He said, are you President Rutland? I said, I am. He said, 
I don't know if you know, he left some money in his will for Southeastern University. I said, I did not know that. He never mentioned it to me, but I said, isn't that thoughtful and wonderful? You know, how much could it be? $20. So he said, yes, it's going to take us a while. We've got to sell his orange groves. Or oranges off his tree. I thought he meant a tree in the backyard. He had hundreds of acres of orange groves. I said, well, when you sell his orange groves, how much is in the will for Southeastern? He said, it's a million dollars. Our second million dollar contribution. Please don't misunderstand what I'm telling you. Please don't misunderstand what I'm telling you. I'm, if you're hearing wrong, it's, it's on you. It's not on me. If you're hearing me say you write a check for Generations United for $1,000 and you're going to get $2 million contributions, you're not here. What I'm saying is it opens the flow. That's all I'm saying. It opens the flow. You begin to tithe or move toward it in faith. Go as close to it as you can. Make progress. Then you begin to move into the area of offerings. Ask God for generosity of life. Ask him for generosity of life, not just, not everything. I, I, I came around the corner. I was at a church the other day in Atlanta. I came around the corner of the building from the parking lot to go in the front door. There was a boy standing there and had about four or five books in his hand. Looked like he had just come from class, a teenage boy. And I said, hey, you handsome, how you doing? And he dropped them. I said, well, did I scare you? He said, well, I'm 18. Nobody has ever called me handsome. Well, that... That's just sad. Didn't he have a mother? Didn't he have a dad? Didn't he have somebody? Just generosity of life. And then generosity, just giving to open the flow. Blessed that you might be blessed to move in under the financial favor of God. If that makes you feel spooky or it doesn't seem right or it feels like you're trying to use or manipulate God, I... I, I can only say to you, in my spirit, it feels perfectly okay. I'm not trying to force God into a corner. I can't bribe God. I'm not trying to do a deal with God. What I'm saying is, God, I'm going to give and give and give generously, but I have faith that you will not let me suffer for it. I believe you that, it, that you will return it to me. Cast your bread upon the waters and it will come back to you. Give, and it should be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I don't know all that that means, and I'm not trying to come up with an arithmetic formula. Give this, and that'll happen, and give this, and that'll happen. That's not what I'm dealing with. I'm talking about uncork the bottle. Let, let, it, let the wind blow through your financial life. Experience the joy of it. And the and see what God will do. Just see what he'll do. Let him bless you with financial favor. I hope instead of being, allowing yourself to be offended with this message, don't allow yourself that emotional luxury. Instead of being offended with this message, why don't you say to yourself, God, take me into the adventure. If I'm not tithing, let me start. If I don't have faith to tithe, show me where my faith is. If it's at 3%, 5%, 7%, just know where it is and start there. When you learn the faithfulness of God at that level, then move forward. If 3% this year, 7 next year, 10%. This is the miracle of tithing. At 3%, you will have about the same amount left over as you do at 10%. I, I, that's the, that's the mystery of God's arithmetic. But when you then get to 10%, then you move into the joy of, and the generosity of offering, of going beyond that. So that, see what you don't want to say to God is, you give your tithe and then some Sunday pastor says, we're going to take a missions offering. And you say, oh no, I gave it the office. I gave it the office, I tithe. What if God did that to you? Remember that hymn from Annie Johnson Flint? He giveth and giveth and giveth again. So what, what if you went to him and said, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me. He said, no, no, I gave you last week. I gave it the office. I already forgave you once. That's finished. 
What we expect is for God to keep giving and keep giving and keep forgiving and give again and forgive again. All I'm saying is, I want Jesus to look at the way I give and say, as he said of that widow, that's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. Well, let me close with this. You've been very patient. Sammy O'Donnell, who is our African director, and I had gone to a village of 1981. Uh, Ghana, West Africa, was in terrible shape. It was under a communist military dictatorship. It was violent. It was scary. It was a, it was a bad time in Ghana. We went to a remote village, no running water, nothing. And we did an outdoor crusade, just set up a little platform and we did it. And it was hours in the hot blazing sun and they stood there. And then when we left, many people got saved. Many, when we left, we, uh, Sammy and me and a couple of other guys in a beat up old Peugeot and we started over toward the car and the crowd just followed us to the car. And they were cheering and singing and everything. And just as we got to the car, Coming over the heads of the people, there was a live chicken with its wings folded back and a rope around it like this, and a live chicken and a loaf of bread. I'm not talking about Wonder Bread wrapped up. It's just a, a naked loaf of bread just being handed hand to hand to hand to hand. Over the, and a chicken and a loaf of bread just coming over the crowd. And as it came through, people were cheering and cheering. And we got to the car, and somebody thrust it into my hand. A live chicken and a loaf of bread. And I... I turned to Sammy and I said, I, I can't accept this. I can't accept this. This may be the only chicken in the village. They're starving. I can't accept this. I'm, I'm talking to him in English, so none of them could hear it. He said, oh, Obroni, Obroni means white man. He said, oh, Obroni, you're going to accept it. He said, you're going to hold that chicken and get in that car. I said, no, Sammy, I, I can't. I just can't. He said, they have nothing. I said, I know. He said, would you then also steal their joy? He said, it would give them joy. He said, you hold that chicken up and you say, thank you. And I lifted the chicken and the bread up and I said, thank you, thank you, I, I appreciate it. And the people were cheering and cheering. When we drove off, me holding that chicken on my lap, when we drove off, we could see them in the rearview mirror cheering and dancing. And then it thought, that's how God is. What would you give God that he needs what would, you, what would you give God? You know, we come forward with our check and God says, oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Look at that. And the angels are standing behind God saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> Great, Lord. Yeah. Mm, we need that. <laughs> That's going to really help us here. No, I mean, God owns the cattle on a thousand hillsides. God doesn't need one thing you give. But he says, if I will accept what they give and bless them in return, I will not steal their joy. God wants to grant you not only financial favor, but the joy of generosity.